It is my esteemed pleasure that I stand now to present our lecturer, our seminar leader. I'm much like Dr. C.A.W. Clark that pastor the Good Street Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas. During Dr. Clark's lifetime, he was fondly remembered for saying, he that needs an introduction doesn't deserve one, and he that deserves one don't need one. Yeah. Certainly this is quite befitting to our lecturer, our presenter for today. Yeah. But I just think it's only fair, just, and right that I present him. And I'm honored to have this moment to do that. Amen. He's going to lead us in a lecture that I feel is very current, one that certainly pastors and church people and church congregations need to uh, make themselves abreast of because over the past um, 30 plus weeks, most of our church worship has been interrupted or readjusted because of this infectious disease known as COVID-19. In the midst of this, we feel that uh, in due time, God is going to uh, heal the land. He's going to restore our church fellowship. But in the midst of it, we're going to have to continue to contend with it and make good, wise decisions on our practices and especially when it comes down to social distancing. I'm a firm believer that knowledge is power. Uh, and for that reason, we want to make sure that this lecture is a ardent part of the curriculum for the 2020 fourth annual convention conference of the Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church. Our lecturer, our presenter will lead us under the subject matter of church safety, return to in-person worship. This is crucial. This is vital because we understand that there's been so many lives taken by this infectious disease. And we all want to get back to our sanctuaries. We all want to be able to see each other in fellowship like we once did. But we're going to have to make sure that we go through certain procedures and protocols until the Lord has given what I would call holistic healing. And I believe some of the holistic healing will come through the knowledge that we obtain because when we know better, we can do better. Well, we've got someone that is a teacher that has been anointed and appointed to teach, to preach, to pastor, and to lead. He is a great humanitarian in his own rights. I'm glad to refer to him and reference him as my friend. He's my working colleague. He serves as the vice president of the Fellowship Missionary Baptist Convention of Georgia. He serves as the most able pastor of the Mount Zion Baptist Church, Albany, Georgia. All his list of accomplishments are just a little too long for us to even get it all on streaming. But I'm honored that he will come to us with this lecture. And I'm speaking none other than Dr. Daniel Simmons. If you would, give your listening ear and an open heart to church safety, return in-person worship by Dr. Daniel Simmons. Um, what you just saw happen when I stepped back is one of the new realities that we have to live with as we talk about church safety. Just that moment of sanitizing um, can be the difference between life and death. And so we, we thank uh, Pastor Mike, President Mike, for his diligence and vigilance and making sure that we are safe. Uh, we give honor today to God, our Savior, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, and to our able president, President Mike. Uh, one of the blessings in life are the people that God allows to come into your life, and you can share intimate things. You can share life and ministry together. And we've become intimate friends we've become sharers in this ministry and life that God has called us to and I am better uh, because of the fellowship and the relationship show me who you hang with show show me who who your partners are and I can prophetically tell you how far you're going uh, just based on the company you keep and 
And, and my, my journey has gotten better and higher uh, since we started walking together. Do, do you want to know one of the saddest things for a leader or a person to be in a room and to be the smartest person in the room? There's no growth in that room. And a lot of people are afraid to surround themselves with smart, energetic people. And, and so when I get in the room with this man and the people that he's gathered around him, I'm always in a learning mode because uh, he don't just have dummies and yes people around him, uh, but thinking people and innovative people. And I'm just glad to be in that number. Glad to be able to serve and to him and all of the other officers of this convention. Uh, to those of you who are sharing with us in this virtual format, uh, what a joy it is to be here. Also, uh, what a joy it is for us as a convention to meet needs according to our purpose through this format. Um, I am excited about all of the other uh, workshops, seminars that you are getting to see and to participate in. Those are designed to meet the needs of our local church. And not the church of yesterday, but to serve this present age, our calling to fulfill. And, um, and so I am just, just thankful to be a part of it. And I want to be timely and, and move along. And again, thank you, Mr. President, for the opportunity to, um, to do this. And I'm thankful to have three of our members from Albany sharing with us. Uh, and the folk in Albany already know the names I'm getting ready to call. Uh, Brother Albert Simmons, Brother Ernest Williams, and Eric Williams. Uh, those are my ride or die partners. Um, in, in fact, I, I probably uh, shouldn't say this on live stream, but I will say it. Uh, there was a man one time who said, I would go down to the church and whoop him. Talking about me. But he got three fellas down there. <laughs> They will kill you before they let you get to him. So, and I don't know that that's true, but I'm glad they think that. <laughs> uh, so let, let, let me move to my task. And I want to talk about church safety as we return to in-person worship in this COVID-19 environment. And let me just say a couple of general things and then I'm going to move to some specific things. First thing I want to say is COVID-19 is real. This is not fake news. When you look at the number of people who have died, when you look at the number of people who have been impacted, this is not fake news. It is real. And so we've got to respond to it like it's real. And like it's a life and death situation. Second thing I want to say about it, it is not going away soon. And so the idea that we can see it and say, okay, I've talked to some people, I'm just going to wait till the first of the year and then we'll go back and things will be normal. Things will not be normal by the first of the year. Uh, yeah, yeah. This, this is going to be a marathon uh, that we are part of. And so we just got to settle in our minds that it is not going anywhere. We, we've got to do like the children of Israel in response to Jeremiah's message in uh, Jeremiah 29. Don't listen to the false prophets who tell you that this is not going to last long and to go ahead and just live life and you'll just be careless, but settle in. Uh, this is going to last for a while, but don't lose despair while you are settling in because God says, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to bless you. Plans to prosper you. Plans to give you a future. And we will be able to declare our latter days were even better than our former days. Uh, and then the last thing I see in general is there, there is hope. Even in the midst of this pandemic. Because the God we serve is still in charge. He's still in charge. And because he's in charge, we know that we're going to make it through. And so what I want to do now is just move into this lecture and uh, share with you some things to consider. And the first thing I want to just be real clear about, my purpose today is not to tell you when to go back. 
but to tell you some things you need to consider as you prepare to go back and make that decision because when is different for every congregation. There is no one date that everybody should go back. And so again, not telling you when, but I'm gonna help you get ready for when that day comes. And those of us who are in the church, we've got to understand this as well and settle this in our mind. We do have to go back. Now, how we go back will be different. But we do, at some point, have to go back. Uh, we cannot allow the doors of the church and I know people who are real deep and spiritual where the church has never been closed and, and you don't have to be in the walls and all of that is true but hear me we are never to forsake the assemblings of, of ourselves together hear me as the body of Christ there are some things that we can only give to our people because we're in close proximity in the same place and so uh, at some point we have to go back and when we go back, we've got to make sure that we provide a safe environment. And so here we go. The first thing I want to share with you, and, and you can just write down this acronym. There's been a lot of talk about PPE. Well, I got a new PPE for you as you get ready to go back. The first E, P rather, is for pray. One of the things that you've got to do is pray and ask God for direction. This thing is something that we don't understand. Even those who are the experts, they're giving us misinformation. Politics has gotten involved in it. And so we've got people who are changing the criteria daily based on what is politically uh, correct, based on what is profitable co politically for certain people. And so we don't know what the truth is. Yeah. And so we, we got to do what Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says as we walk through this. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all of your ways, even in COVID-19, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. And so pastors, I'm saying to you first, begin to pray about when to go back, how to go back. Begin to pray, but don't pray by yourself. Yeah. Pull together some members of your congregation. Pull together some of your friends, your mentors, yeah. some of your comrades in ministry and ask them to pray with you and begin to pray to God for direction on what you need to do in preparation to go back. Pray to him for the resources that you need after, after the plan is revealed to you. Just pray for, to God about every aspect of this. And here's what I know for, for a fact. God will answer your prayer. God will give you the instructions and everything else that you need to get ready to bring your people back safely. So don't underestimate the power of prayer and you don't have to be in the same place to pray but you need to pray and again engage your members in the activity and and to tell you the truth that's that's the biggest thing you can do but I'm not gonna spend much time on that one because you already know so here's the next one after you pray you want to listen to God and begin to put a plan together that's the second P and the PPE you got a plan and I'm going to give you some steps for your planning. Prayerfully build a team. Choose some people within your church. Some of them you would choose based on the position they hold. So for example, if you've got a security ministry in your church, surely you want them on your team. If you've got a medical uh, ministry in your church, you want those on your team. You want the ushers on, uh, on the team. You want leadership in those. But then there are some people who are going to be, to be able to help you who may not be in a position, but they possess the expertise and the gift to help you in the planning. And, and so what you've got to do is prayerfully build you a planning team and I'm talking to some people now who may say pastor I don't have the people in my church to build a team that's not an issue the kingdom kingdom of God is bigger than your membership and 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 so look outside of your church 
there are people out there who are willing to help you. And I want to share with you that as many members as I have, I had some people on our re-entry team who were not members of our church. Simply because of their expertise and another reason because of their access to information that I needed. And, and, and so build you a team. And then once you get the team together, the next thing you want to do is gather information about your members' concern about safety as they return and also COVID-19 protocols. Say that again. Gather information about member concerns. Talk to your members. Let other folk talk to your members because sometimes your members won't say things to you, Pastor, that they will say to other folk. And, and, and here's why it's important that, that you see what your members are concerned about because they are the ones that need to come back and you can do a whole lot of things but if you've not addressed their concerns then you still got a problem and sometimes you 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 would be amazed but those concerns are rooted in misinformation for example I had a person say uh, pastor pastor I, I trust you but I don't I don't want to come back uh, inside the building you know um, I'll, I'll meet you outside but I can't come back inside and I said well, what, what are your concerns about inside they say COVID get in the walls <laughs> I said they they say COVID is it yeah they say if anybody walk in the building it will get in the walls and, 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 and when you walk through the church it just come off the walls and get you and, and now as fun as that sound that is the truth she was serious she heard that she believed that and so I could have, could have sprayed it all day, but I couldn't have convinced her that, that it wasn't in the wall. And, and so, and so you, you learn what their concerns are, and then you can address those. Because if they don't feel safe, nothing you do will make them safe. And, and, and then you got to be informed about the COVID-19 protocols. And, and one of the things I mentioned earlier about people having access, because what I discovered is there are two sets of protocols. Uh, it's what they give to the general public. And then it's what they have privately within a certain circle of folk. You see, um, government leaders get different information than we get. Yeah, we don't, we, we don't get it all. And so you want to you make sure you, you get it all. And that's why you talk to folk inside and outside. And so you understand what it is for churches. You understand what it is for, for office space and all of these different uh, concerns that you have, that people have. And so you want to gather the information and uh, members concerns COVID-19 protocols and then as a team you sit down and prayerfully work through that I see. I see. and you de develop strategies around the information that you got and what God has given you for returning to your church and then you start moving forward to do this to prepare the place for in-person worship for people to feel safe, there are certain things you've got to do to prepare the place. And you can, can uh, again, discover those protocols. And, and I brought this along with me because one of the things that people think is that, that it's expensive to do it. And so when COVID-19 hit, we got these calls from folk wanting to come and spray our church for thousands of dollars. But we gathered our information and we found the place and we bought this machine for $75. And there is a gallon of chemicals that come with it and you dilute it with water. And if you've been in our sanctuary, you're talking about a place that seats um, 2,400 people. Uh, that 86 gallon jug would do our sanctuary two times per week and other space for three months. A $75 machine, $80 and we spraying our whole place two times a week for three months versus a thousand dollars and 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 this is effective in doing that and, and all the members of Mount Zion know that that we use this and because we we send them a video <laughs> all of them got a video and all of the other things the temperatures and the protocols and and all these things that you, you prepare the place you you do walkthroughs and making sure that the place is ready 
the place is ready. And, and let me share this with you. Um, and one of those concerns for us that was the most difficult to get ready um, was the singing ministry. Because when you look at um, some of the deaths and stuff that occurred from church, here's what you got to keep in mind. It's not the gathering that made people sick. It's gathering wrong. And, 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 and because they didn't have the information, so around the choirs, you got people singing and, and all this projectile, as they call it, out of the mouth. And um, the microphones. Microphones are deadly. And so you... And again, you, you, you gather the information. Uh, there's a little box. I, I, I must have left it over there, but there, there's these, these little ultra light things that you can buy. And we bought a small one and we bought a big one. He's, he's bringing it to me. But this little small box, you put that microphone head in it and every germ in it, in a few minutes, it kills it. And then there's a bigger one that, that we use for multiple, and again, these are very inexpensive. And then even more than that, uh, for $20, you can buy a hundred of these coverings that, um, that you put over the microphone. And so what we try to do is make sure nobody ever speaks behind another person. But if that is the case, you cover it. Because as I'm talking, I guarantee you something coming out of my mouth. <laughs> and you know where it's, where it's lodging? It is going straight down in all these little fibers and cores. And the next person who come behind me, you get my stuff. When I touch it with my hand and, and, and what you saw happening, cleaning it, that takes care because I might have COVID and I've touched it. And, and people standing together sing. And so you have to, for your church, work out a plan to manage all of that. Where people stand, how they stand, all of that matters now. It matters. Um, and even from the pulpit, just, just working out the singing, working out from the pulpit, because it's in the talking that it is transferred most, talking and singing. And so in making the place ready, preparing the place, you consider all of that. Bathroom, door handles, entry, just you understand what I'm saying. You gather the information and you make it happen. And... Um, People had concerns about the seats. Will it stay in the seats? So if Pastor Mike gets up, do, if I sit where he sat, will I get it? And so th there's a way to address all of that. And so you prepare the place. And while you are preparing the place, here's the next thing you got to do. Prepare the people. Prepare the people for return to in-person service. Because here's, here's what you would discover. Not only are you going to have to prepare them for the safety issues and allay every concern that they have, but you're going to have to prepare them for the changes in worship style. Because there are things that we've been doing that we won't be able to do anymore. Um, for example, when you come back, you've got some some very spiritual deacons who, who love to get up there and do devotion. You can't do devotion like you've done it in a COVID-19 setting without some kind of adjustments. And so people have got to be prepared for the way they are going to have to do things. Offering, communion. Um, we, 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 we're going to have problems if we put that communion table down there. About 15 or 20 of us gather shoulder to shoulder like we do in some places around that communion table singing and praying, it's going to be some issues. It's, it's going to be some issues if I got that communion tray and I take my hand, even if I got on gloves, uh, because what you will find is these cloth gloves we wear uh, uh, hold contamination just like our hands. So if I take my communion cup and I'm, and I'm the usher, I'm the deacon, I'm passing it down, the road, down your road, I may pass you COVID. And so from communion to devotion to singing to taking up offering, everything that we do has to be examined and, and some adjustments have to be made. And our people don't like change. And so we've got to prepare our people because what you will hear is this don't feel like church anymore. And so prepare the people's mind. Mindset is important. Get their minds ready for the new change. 
service will be shorter. What? We got out in an hour and 15 minutes? In an hour? I don't feel like I've been to church. I don't know what to do with myself all day. And, and not only the worship service, but church, su Sunday school, church school, whatever you call it, will be different. Auxiliaries will meet different. Ministries will meet different. Everything about church and the methods we've used will change. And you've got to get people ready for the change. And you do that before you get them back in the house. Help them to shift the paradigm. They know what to expect. They, they are ready for it. So prepare the people. And this is a big one because here it is. The pastor has to be prepared. Prepare the pastor for re-entry. Because the pastor too is a little resistant to change. <laughs> and, 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 and so the pastor is going to especially because he's the leader, is going to have, a whole, have to have a whole new paradigm about ministry and how it works. All of us, whether we say it publicly or not, we've had metrics where by we measure our success as pastors. Those metrics are gone. So, for example, we, we would count um, members and numbers. And so on Sunday morning, if, if, if I showed up and I had 25 folk in my sanctuary on a Sunday morning, I'd be upset. I think I, I, I'm a failure. Well, what's happening? The church is dying. Yeah. Tell you something. I don't want. <laughs> we don't need the numbers we've had before. Right. And so if I'm going to measure myself by numbers, yeah. you know, I'm in trouble. By budgets and buildings and bodies. Yeah. And so much of how we've measured ourselves and the things that our self-esteem was in, it's gone. It's gone. And so you're going to have to just have to shift in your mindset about how you measure ministry and yourself. And you're going to have to help the church to understand that as well. And here's the biggest one, pastors. We are going to have to shift in our mind in terms of how we present the gospel. Here, here is what we do and we are right to do it. We preach the gospel based on the audience that's in front of us. Because that's who I want to reach. But when you come back, and I'm going to talk more about this in a minute. But I am hoping that you will not abandon the virtual world. And so, and so what you have to keep in mind now is that you are preaching from a pulpit to people who are in the audience and that's localized. But when that camera is on you, that is globalized. And because you are now trying to reach a global audience, I promise you, the same localized presentation won't work for a global audience. The, the, uh, the, the audience in the global world is more diverse than the people sitting in your pew. And if you want to hold their attention, if you want to reach them with the gospel, you got to present in a way that can capture their attention. And so the way that you present the gospel is going to have to be tweaked. And even in terms now of um, the presentation of the gospel is more than just you. But it is what that audience sees in the screen when they look at you. And so if, if I got a lot of stuff in the background that's distracting, and for the folk in the audience, it doesn't matter. I got to consider that the folk in the virtual world cannot pay attention to me because of all this stuff I got going on. And, 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 so, and so the pulpit is my localized audience. But that virtual world is my platform to a global world. And, 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 and so what's the presentation? And those of you that have been concerned about how your church looks, 
see, see how nice this pulpit is? Yeah, yeah. That global audience, they're making an assessment of your ministry based on the physical uh, presentation of your facility. Let me ask you a question. If, if you were in a place and you were searching for a restaurant and then you went online to, to look and you pulled a picture up, the carpet dirty, the table's nasty, they got paper on them because the, 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 the legs are not even, it's rocking. Dishes not clean. Just looking at it, it looked like it smelled. Cooks got on nasty clothes. The servers got on nasty clothes. They all jacked up. Yeah. I am not going there. And so when people look at you, what's the presentation that they see around you? And if you're going to be showing audience shots, you got to consider, uh, let your folk in media know, be careful what you show. Now those folk that hung out all night and they're sleeping to the, through the service, don't. <laughs> There's a hole in the wall over there, don't. <laughs> and, and, and so all of these things, pastors, you've got to now consider. Because listen, this platform that we have that is global now, we can truly in ways we've never done before reach the world for Christ. And, and, and you talk to pastors who are doing it and what they will tell you is that they've been amazed at this new audience they've been able to reach. Well, pastor, I can't afford to do that. You can't afford not to do it. Yeah. And, and here it is. If, if it's God's vision, and it is God's vision for us to, re to reach the world, then God's provision will come. And, and you talk about growing a church and that's growing it numerically. You can do that in this global platform. But here's the other thing I need you to know. You can grow the financial stewardship of your church through this platform in ways that you can't uh, as fast with that localized congregation. Because the people who are watching you, the God who knows what the vision is, will touch their hearts and they'll begin to send the money and you will see your revenue growing and, and, and a part of that platform means you got to have the means available in the virtual world for them to give to you. And again, you can't afford not to have them in place. And then people start sending it. See, all of us got those loyal, faithful members. They're going to drive to the church. Drop it off. They're going to put it in the mail. But there, but there are some folk out there, if you don't have the virtual format for them to do it, they won't do it. And, 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 and so, Pastor, we got the shift. In our presentation, preaching, teaching, praying, and in the presentation of the facility, and just take into account. Now, you're not trying to be Hollywood, but you are trying to use this new platform that God has you, has for you, and, um, and, and, and help the members. Part of preparing them is helping them to understand that we now have a localized audience and a globalized audience. And, and one of the things that pastors have had to do who are in this virtual platform is redefine membership and how we serve members. Because when you get a member from, from another state, how do you serve them? When somebody from another country say, I've, I've been tuning into your ministry every Sunday and I want to be a part of your church, how do you serve them? And so all, all of that is a part of your planning. And so when you do it, we, we call it a hybrid church. That's, that's what we are committed to going forward at Mount Zion, a hybrid church. Hybrid, got some people in the audience, but we got a globalized audience that's bigger than my localized audience. Our, our virtual church has outgrown our local church. And then... So those are some things that you could, can consider. And again, I didn't try to cover everything, but I'm trying to open your mind. Be your, pray. Then start planning. Be your team. Members, non-members, gather information. Member concerns, COVID-19. Prepare the place for in-person worship. Prepare the people for in-person worship. Make these minor and major changes because there's going to have to be some changes. Prepare the pastor. <laughs> and then um, this idea of hybrid, just be committed to that because we have a whole new platform.
And then the third thing is execution. PPE. You got to execute the plan. And as you execute the plan, keep in mind that you got to be flexible because what you're going to do every step of the way is evaluate the plan. And as you go along and learn, you got to make adjustments along the way. But uh, some people are good at planning but not execution. At, at some point, you got to pull the trigger. At some point, you got to release the people to execute the plans that have been made. And I emphasize release the people because pastor, if you're going to bring them back, you cannot be in charge of all the things, everything, the whole process. You got to empower people. And execute the plan. And have somebody to stand away from the activities of the plan to evaluate, to see what you can't see. You inspect what you expect. And, 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 and a lot of times in the church when we start evaluating, we run into this barrier. If we address a concern we see, we are afraid of hurting somebody's feeling. I, I, I had a member yesterday, nobody, Tuesday, we had a staff meeting and nobody would know who I'm talking about other than the people in the meeting. I'm not going to call in a name. And so in the evaluation process, they recognize the problem. And this is what he said. Uh, I said, well, did you address? Yeah, 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 but pastor, I don't want them to know I told on them. I said, let me, let me tell you something. You can't be concerned in this environment about somebody knowing that you told on them. Because the activity they, was, they were engaging in is life and death. And then we discover after somebody's sick and dead that you knew, but you were scared to tell it. You, you, you got to deal with it. It may be my best friend. It may be my wife, my sister, my cousin. But whoever, that, we, we, we have to deal with it. So we evaluate and we plan and we adjust. And then, and in that evaluation process and the flexibility, please understand that going back cannot be in concrete. Because at any minute in time, this whole thing might shift. And, 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 and as people say, I don't want to be political today, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and be a little political. But given the political climate we're in, and the indifference to this virus, um, it may get worse again. We thought we had seen the worst of it, but it may get even worse because things are loosening up and people are engaging in, in reckless behavior. And, and so you can't be afraid if it gets out of hand to close the door again. That has to be a, a part of the plan. If the time comes, we got to go back to ground zero, we go back. And everybody knows that. And so that's, that's what I want to leave with you. But also, um, just because we've had people coming back and dealing with this hybrid for a while, just want to share this with you so, so you will know. That one of the reasons it's important to pray up front is I shared with you, you know, we don't understand this, we got to lean on God. But I also want to share with you from experience that it won't be without opposition. There are going to be people who are going to be wishing for something tragic to happen in your place of worship. They were afraid to come back and so they are hoping that something happens so they can say, see, we were smart. Smarter than those folk over there. We knew not to go back, but they went back and we knew something was going to happen and so they're going to be wishing it on you. And then there are some people who will come and try you. They know that you require mass. They will show up. And come through the door, go through the protocol checks, and as soon as they get in their seat, and the preacher gets up and they figure nobody going to interrupt with the preacher, the mask comes off. And they want to stand up and holler back at the preacher.
They don't want to abide. They, they want to do things to create problems. And so you have to be ready for that. But know that the God that you got your directions from is more than able to take care of you. So you got to be prepared for that kind of thing. And then here's the last thing I'll say in terms of one of the things I've learned. You will, at least I did and we did, you will never get to the place where there is not some degree of fear because you realize the gravity of what you have involved people in. And as a leader, you realize that they came back on your word. You said that the Lord said it was time to come back. You said you did everything to make sure we were safe. You said all the precautions that we were taking, the seating, the temperatures, that we were safe. But, but, but Reverend, we came back and it didn't turn out like you said. That's a load on, on anybody's shoulder. And, and the way that you deal with that kind of fear, the way that you deal with those thoughts is to have a little talk with yourself. And say, I said what the Lord said. And we did what the Lord told us to do. But even in doing all of that, we know that it's not enough. And so what we have to do is trust in him with all of our heart. And lean not on our own understanding, but in all of our ways acknowledge him. And then we watch him take care of us. He's still a refuge in the storm. He can still be a shelter and take care of us. He, 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 he can still... He can still, he can still provide. God bless you. And anything beyond this lecture that we can do uh, to help you, just call us. Anything we've done, anything we got, any resources, we'll be glad to share it. God bless you. President Mike, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity.